Yes, I can see it. It's coming? I think so. It says it's being recorded. Yes, I see, I see it on YouTube. Okay. So we'll give we'll give our friends another minute or two. It's not noon yet by my clock, and then we'll get started. There we go. Either my computer is two minutes fast or my watch two minutes late. What time is it? Or should we get started? It's past noon. It's one past five on my. Okay. So I think we, we can get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Even for one of our panelists, good very late evening. <clears throat> so thank you for joining us for what I, I am sure have no doubts will be yet another very, very exciting, fine seminar. Before uh, we get onto the menu for today, like we normally do, I want to very quickly mention uh, that we had a fantastic talk last week, which was uh, by Lee Coren from Israel discussing testosterone in wildlife. Next week, uh, do I get it right? Give me a second. Yes. Next week, we will hear from Noah snyder Mackler, who is an assistant professor at Arizona State University. He will be discussing environmental determinants of health and aging in primates. So that is a week from today. Noah snyder Mackler. For today, what we're doing is a panel discussion with editors in the behavioral sciences. And I have to say that the idea of doing this really was cooked together with a set of four very motivated young colleagues that I will describe in a few minutes. Uh, they identified editors of, of the journals where all of us publish, including behavioral ecology and sociobiology, behavioral ecology, PNAS, and ethology. So today we're very lucky to have a, as member of, of the panel, Theo Bakker, the co-editor-in-chief of Behavioral Ecology and Sociobiology, Louis Barrett, editor-in-chief of Behavioral Ecology, Raghavendra Gadatkar, member editor of PNAS, and Wolfgang Goyman, editor-in-chief of Ethology. Like I said, everything, all the mechanics, all the ideas for the panel were put together by these four contributors, Alba Garcia de la Chica, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, David Wood, a doctoral student at Yale University, Kaya Tombak, postdoctoral fellow at the Simon Society Fellows in CUNY, US, and Facundo Fernandez Duque, doctoral student at the University of Illinois. What they did is they put together a list of questions organized around three themes study design and planning, statistical pitfalls, and institutional change. Their motivation was to hear from our panelists today in how their journals are adjusting, they're modifying practices, they're incorporating new practices with all the changes that we're seeing in approaches to data analysis, uh, everything that's happening in sciences these days. So the plans are the following. Each of the panelists will address, answer either one of the questions in the themes, or maybe they will just have some general comments for that theme. We will take one theme at a time. So when we start with study design and planning, we will start with Theo Bakker, we'll go alphabetically. Theo will talk for two or three minutes addressing one of the questions that relate to study design and planning. I ask the panelists if you can please either state if you're answering a specific question or you're making some remarks or comments around a topic that relates to the theme. 
will listen from all four panelists. They will talk for between two and three minutes. Uh, I've already told them they get an F if they go over three minutes. After that, uh, we'll give them another five minutes to really have a conversation among them. I think we all want to hear what they have to say to each other, address each other's questions, etc. And then we'll take questions from the four contributors. We will not take questions from the audience after each theme. We were gonna we we plan to have a solid block of time at the end to be taking questions from the audience. When we get to that point, we we will tweak a little bit how we do it at Fine. You normally type a question mark in the chatting window. You do not write the question, just a question mark, and I call you. Today, because the panel was organized and designed by young scholars, we want to encourage more than we ever do to hear from the young scholars. So I ask you that you type S or P after your question to indicate that you're a student or a postdoc. That will allow me to really give you priority as I get all those question marks coming through the chatting. It will allow me to screen students and postdocs more quickly. So once again, this is a, our plan for today. I want to really thank Theo, Luis, Rag, and Wolfman. Uh, not only they are committing their time to the panel, but they did communicate with each of the contributors individually and discuss the questions and plan ahead. So thank you for volunteering your time for that. I'm sure will be a fantastic discussion. I may bring up as we transition from one theme to the other, the, the titles of the themes, but we decide that we're better off looking at each other's faces than staring at a PowerPoint slide. So uh, with that, uh, I ask the contributors, uh, as soon as you see that the panelist is finishing talk, just open your mics so that you can easily jump in and ask a question if you have one. With that, we're gonna get started hearing from Theo Bakker. Uh, regarding the question that he may have chosen or the topic related to study design and planning. Theo. Good uh, day, everybody. I'm happy to uh, to sit in this uh, panel. I had some feedback with, from my co-editor-in-chief. So we are running the journal together, uh, James Sarniello and me. So we have also some feedback from him. So regarding study design and planning, there are a number of topics that we, uh, uh, with our journal is uh, intending to, and that is, uh, so the methods, let, let us start with the last question. The methods belong to the, to the article, not in the supplement. That's our, that's our ID, because they are very important and you cannot put them in a supplementary file. So that's one thing. We, uh, we welcome also descriptive explorative studies because they are also valuable. So all work cannot be appropriately framed into an uh, hypothesis testing. So I think that's fine to have that. Uh, the, the, the question about the difference between observation experimental studies is that uh, the biggest problem here is pseudo replication, I think. So you have to mark the animals to avoid pseudo replication. And you can do that by marking or you can do this statistically in your models. But uh, I think this is the biggest uh, difference between the fields and the, and, the, and the experimental studies in the lab. The resistance reports, I think uh, Koeman's will, uh, Wolfgang will talk a lot about that because they applied it to uh, ethology. We had a long discussion about that. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of that. So I will not go into detail. It will be discussed later, I think. Uh, power analysis, of course, are very, are very important. Uh, but behavior ecologists may not always be able to meet the, uh, the uh, sample size indicated by the power analysis. It depends on the focal species. You have to look at that case by case, I think. Uh, it's an important, but sample size cannot always be very high. Think on great apes. If you are studying great apes, that's different if you are studying bacteria. So that's power analysis. And uh, replication of experiments are, of course, important, but I don't think there is no justification to to make a, a, a specific journal for, just for replicated experiments. 
replication is, uh, can be published in, in the normal journals if there is a really a controversy that should be resolved by replicating the study. But otherwise, I think there is no, no need for a replication to publish that in normal journals. And I don't think that there will, there's no journal who will only publish replicated studies. I don't think that's, uh, that's because it's just a replication of already uh, published thing. Only when there are controversies, you can do that. Okay, that's my contribution to this first scene. Thank you. Uh, we'll follow with Louise Barrett. Thanks, uh, thanks Eduardo, and thanks everybody for um, putting together these excellent questions. Um, the theme of study design and planning seemed to me it was it was dealing with two basic, there were two elements to that theme. One was how do we ensure the integrity of science generally and ensure the integrity of papers? And the other one was like, you know, the, the way in which we can ensure we have, you know, assuming the data are, you know, nobody's doing any shenanigans, how do we ensure that we're getting robust, reliable um, results? And so, I mean, I'm just going to agree with Theo, 100% on the methods should be in the paper and not in the supplementary material. Supplementary material should be what it says. It should be supplementary to the main um, findings and just add information. Um, <clears throat> and so just to address the first question, which was um, about how some journals will explicitly welcome replicates of earlier experiments and whether there should be a journal type for this kind of article or a dedicated section. This is something that um, the editorial board at Behavioural Ecology have been talking about, particularly due to recent issues concerning cases where data have been found to be unreliable and where there has been evidence of misconduct found and um, papers have been retracted. And you know that's a waste of everyone's time and energy, and it leads us down by blind alleys. It can be a waste of research money. It undermines trust in a particular area. It can undermine trust in a particular area of research. Um, so in that sense, you know, encouraging people to replicate findings and ensure they're right, that, that's a good way to detect early on that you've got problems potentially with particular areas. So we are discussing how you could perhaps enact some kind of pre-registration or registered reports as a way to, to improve and uphold standards. And I think it's also helpful to place the emphasis where it should be placed, which is on the quality and rigor of the methods and the analyses rather than the results, right? What the particular thing that you find. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a big issue generally, I think, that a lot of these questions are talking about power analysis and sample size and, you know, and I think that's all very, very important. And But I do think that what we need to be focusing on and what I, I encourage everyone to focus on, and Neil Stingamanser, who's also, um, he's a forum editor and he deals with particular um, kinds of submissions, is, biologic, is biological significance and not statistical significance. And that's the real thing. And so in a sense, that's that's the point that we're trying to push. So all of these questions that are put forward, and there's a question that comes up later in another thing about Bayesian analysis. I think that's the, that's the issue is that we should to kind of push, not, not encourage people to worry about statistical significance per se, and think about what it is you're trying to show, which is the biological significance of those findings. And in that sense, not finding something is as interesting and is a is, you know no effect is an effect is as important sometimes as finding something positive so i think it's sort of a shift in mindset that we think about there so that's that's my contribution to that thing thanks thank you louis we go now on rye you're next uh, hello. Uh, good morning good afternoon good evening my raghavendra gadakkar from indian institute of science uh, I was very happy to hear of this panel discussion and I loved the questions. I actually have written down my responses to all the questions and given them to the students. Uh, at the end of this meeting, if, they, if it's necessary, I'll be happy if they can be circulated to everybody else because there may not be enough time to say. But before I say anything, I want to say two caveats. First is, I'm here as an editor of PNAS, I'm one of more than 100 editors of a journal that publishes in all branches of science and social science. So unlike ecology, behavioral ecology, or uh, ethology, we are not geared to this. So it has its own problems. And so I will not be able to say what PNAS is doing uh, in this field. The uh, other thing is that 
I have been in the past editors of many other journals. And so I'll speak much more as a sort of general experience as well as my personal opinion. Many of these are not what the journals are doing, but what they should be doing. So again, very briefly for each of these responses, uh, in terms of replicates, my view is even more radical. I think replication is the bedrock of science. The reason why we trust science is because science is a self-correcting process. People keep finding the same thing or discard if they don't find the same thing. So replicating well-known results, important results, is should be mainstream science. And there should be no question of whether that should or should not be accepted, that or should not be in the mainstream journal. By having a separate journal, we are already saying this is not important. So it, not only should it be in the regular journals, but it should be the bread and butter of science. All important results need to be repeated again and again for confirmation. That is the bedrock of, of science. Uh, in terms of power analysis, I agree with what has just been said. In our field especially, it is not possible to have the same gold standards as in other fields. And the solution to that, in my opinion, is that we must, again, it back, comes back to replication. We must replicate the same people, different people should replicate to see whether these results based on small sample sizes are really valid. I can tell you from personal experience that I've actually re repeated an entire experiment and published a paper saying reconfirming X, Y, Z. And this is a full splash paper which I published. And I think this should become the norm. Hey, Ryan, I want to yes. ask you, Please, uh, when you approach the screen, there's a little bit of interference. We hear you so much better. Right, when you're leaning back, it, it is making, at least from my end and some others, it's making a big difference. Uh, we hear you much better if you're sitting like now, as, as opposed okay. to maybe too close to the mic. Okay, so I'll try to be less move, <laughs> moving, which I'm used to do. There I'm, I'm, I'm from Argentina, I understand, don't worry. <laughs> yes, I'm used to dancing, <laughs> yes. Uh, there was a question which uh, has not been addressed yet. And this has to be about pre-registration of trials. And uh, I think in our field, that doesn't really work. In clinical trials and so on, it works. In our field, I don't think you can have a result independent pre-registration. Because I think exploratory studies, as has been said, are very important in our field. And we should not simply blindly follow the fashion that hypothesis testing is big science and natural history is sort of second rate science. In our field, ex natural history, exploration, pursuing ideas are much more important. And I don't think pre-registration really is relevant to our field uh, at all. Uh, I, I need to ask you, I need to ask you to hold it there or we're gonna start falling behind. So I, I'd like to go to Wolfgang and if you would like to expand on some of these questions, we'll have time later. Uh, we, we really want to stay on track so that we can cover all three themes properly and evenly. Thank you so yeah. much. We're going now to Wolfgang. Yeah, hello everybody. And yeah, thanks for joining. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I try to be short. So I, I want to start with one thing that what is really, what I find it really important, that's the methods. I think the methods are central to a paper and they should not be a supplement or something like that. They should be right in the center of the paper. That's where they belong to. And I think we should be strict to that because otherwise it seems you, you gain the expression, the impression that methods are an add-on. It's not really important how you do things. It's just important what you find. And I think the methods are the key. So, and, and, and they should be in the center of the paper. So this, this is something that I find very important. Um, then, yes, the, with the replications, just briefly, I, I welcome replications and we would for sure publish replications in mythology of previous studies. And I don't think there is a, a special journal for that required. I think journals should, should um, welcome replications of earlier studies for all the reasons that have been, been said by the other panelists. And yeah, just briefly regarding the power analysis. I think power analysis is a nice thing, but mainly before you do your study. And as Louise already said, it's important to think about the biological relevance of a, of a result and not so much the statistical uh, significance of a result. 
and the power analysis helps you to define what is the what is sort of the difference that you expect to be a, a meaningful a biologically meaningful difference and and then this will help you to find the right sample size and theo already mentioned it so ethology has like i don't know maybe almost a year ago we have started to to offer publication of pre-registration studies. So we had a discussion among the editors of the journal whether we should do it or not. One of the concerns we had was that we may get too many submissions and, and that we cannot handle that. In principle, I think this is a great idea. I think it's also a great idea for people to get additional independent uh, input to their study before they conduct their study. And as Raghavendra said, for many studies like descriptive or exploratory studies, this is not possible, but many of us do experimental studies. And if you plan such experiments, you can pre-register your study. Having that said, as of today, we haven't had a single submission of a pre-registration study to ethology. So it our fear that we might get overwhelmed with submissions has not come true so far. And I don't know how this develops. I think it's, I, I, I still think it's good that we offer it and that people have the possibility to do it. I don't know how successful it will, it will be in the end. Um, yeah, and in general, just, I mean, I, I would like to quote Wolfgang Wickler, previous editor of Ethology, on, on the difference between descriptive or exploratory studies and hypothesis-driven studies. When, when in discussions, when people sort of highlight the importance of hypothesis-driven research, he used to ask the question, well, how, how do you get your hypotheses from then if you do no exploratory or descriptive work? And I think this is a, this is a key element. And I think we should, we should highlight the importance of descriptive and exploratory studies. And we should also welcome publications of that. I think I've spoken too much already. <laughs> Thank you. We're gonna try, we, we... It's always the case that we're a little bit over our time, but I'd like to, why don't you guys, if you will take from the panelists, if you want to have a little bit of a follow up with your colleagues, the four panelists, we can take a few. Yeah, Louise. Yes, I'd just like to ask Wolfgang, what do, what do you think the reason is potentially why you haven't had it? Because one of the things we've been discussing at Behavioral Ecology is this issue of like, if you're doing a field experiment, even though you're trying to have the design, there's nevertheless uncertainty about exactly how many animals will be, you know, all those kinds of things. There's just inherent uncertainty in this kind of field compared to if you're running a laboratory experiment where you have, you know, you can, you can in fact decide on sample size ahead of time. So do you think it's this thing of like, it's actually just inherently more difficult to put together a pre-registration that, that, that can then be followed through in a, in, you know, in a, in a rigorous way, or is it some other reason? But I, I guess that could be one reason for field experiments. But I would, I would, I mean, we still get a lot of submissions that that are lab experiments and where you could easily do something like that. I I think it might have to do with two things, and 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 one of the things I, I I'm planning on writing an editorial soon about, and that's because in our in our description for the pre-registered studies, we, we basically state that if the study is conducted in the way um, that, that it was designed and accepted by the, by the journal, we will publish the results regardless of what comes out of the study. And what I think is not clear to the people is that they, I mean, we, ethology, commits itself to publishing it. But of course, the people are free to submit it to a different journal if they want to. So, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, honestly, I mean, ethology is not the highest rated behavioral journal. So some people may think, well, if I, if I submit the pre-registration study to ethology, then I'm bound to publishing it there. No, they are not. 
but I mean, they would have the opportunity in, in any case, whatever comes out to publish it there because the editorial process before has decided, okay, this is a, this is a, a valid study that follows uh, or that, that asks a scientific question with the right methods and we would accept it regardless of the outcome, but still they could uh, sort of submit it elsewhere. But that might be only one reason. I think the main reason might be that most people are have this, this time pressure. I mean, they, they, they basically have to start their study. They cannot wait another two or three months until they get the feedback from the pre-registration study. And I think people just, I mean, they have limited funding for a limited period of time and they just want to start their project instead of waiting approval of referees and editors that this is the correct design. So I, I, I think that might be the main, main problem, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know how in other fields, how, how well pre-registration uh, studies are accepted or welcomed by the people, but I think the time issue is a big one. Yeah, one well, of main the main problem is also that uh, the methods are dynamic. I and mean, when you start uh, doing research, you mostly adapt your methods because something is not working, you thought and uh, you will adapt it and that's prevented in re-registered studies. So that's, I think, the main reason for people to, uh, to rely on, on, on that, uh, that, uh, type of, uh, that type of study. And, other, and, and for our journal, we had the problem that we need a special editor specialized on that. So the workload will be increased even more by, by uh, reviewing the methods instead of reviewing the the papers, though so that's that's also was also made us reluctant to introduce that for the journal to increase the uh, the, the the load for the reviewers. Do we have a question from one of the contributors or a follow up on on things that may have been shared by the editors? Yeah, I have a question. I'm wondering if the if the the general synthesis of this discussion is that those of us in the very early stages of our career should be on the lookout for opportunities to pre-register uh, papers and and study designs, but not try to make that kind of the foundations of our career. That that's a useful tool, but shouldn't be universally applied uh, as a whole new convention. Is that is that correct? Is is that an accurate summation of of the panel's feelings on this? I would not start when you are starting to write papers. I would not do it with your first study to do a pre-registered study. It takes more time. It's of course you can learn a lot of it. I think because you can feedback on your methods, but uh, it takes it takes time. Yeah, it's, so it's maybe not the first thing to do when you start your career. Rag, I think that you had opened your mic. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, in fact, I, as I said, in our field, it may not often be useful or practical to have these pre-registration, especially if they're exploratory studies. And I'm very biased towards exploratory natural history-based studies. So I really don't think very much about, uh, about pre-registration. For me, pre-registration is the ideal solution for clinical trials of, of drugs, where I think it should be mandatory to have that. But in our field, I think we should have a lot of flexibility, especially for early career researchers to do research in as many different ways as possible. We must be very flexible. Uh, we should not impose any standards, rules, restrictions, no top-down control. Uh, we should let the young investigators teach us that new ways of doing things. Yeah, I would just agree with that. And I think, I think the thing is, if you think about why are these things instituted, one is to say, well, so that you can have something published regardless of what the results are, and that, that it's still valuable. 
you know it doesn't have to be a surprising novel so that's that sort of sits with the journals more that they have to be more receptive to to those kinds of things but I also think the other side of it is about having integrity and doing it properly and you know and that's that's sort that's on all of us and so I think you can you can you can decide that you will be a uh, high you know you will you will ensure the highest integrity in your work like that's a decision that you yourself can make you don't need any like like Ralph was saying you don't need a top-down control to decide on that and and so I think in a sense what, what's needed is for everybody to, you know, that's that's how science works, isn't it? We should all renew our commitment to data integrity and to the, the integrity of the scientific record. And it's very difficult because you're talking about a sociological phenomenon as well as a scientific one. People's careers matter. People are trying to get ahead or trying to get grants. So it's, a, it's an inherently difficult topic and it's an inherently difficult thing to navigate, particularly at the beginning of your career. But I think us old people should start, you know, stepping up and and and, and emphasizing the, the true value of what we're doing here. And it's about the, the integrity of science and ensuring that we get a better understanding of the world and rewarding people who are contributing to that in the in the very real way. So I think, for example, Richard McElroy should get a medal for, for um, the Max Plan because he has, you know, his book on Bayesian statistics and his his emphasis on methods and analytical rigor and making that the focus has been extremely important. And I think it's made it, it's helping to create a shift in, in, in our thinking. So I think he deserves, you know, massive credit for that. And we should all follow his lead. Yeah, yeah I have nothing, a question. No, nothing to add to that. <laughs> any, any other questions from the contributors? Facundo. Yeah, I don't know if, if we're a little short on time now, but we're okay. Based based on those comments, how would the panel and anybody feel about incorporating pre-registered accepted papers into grants, for example, to kind of show this is something that the scientific community deems valuable and that's something that will get published given funding and that we can carry it through. But again, I also see some of the points that were brought up against that. So how would people feel about incorporating that into grants? Um, I, I would just say kind of the, um, at NSERC, because I've also been I've been involved in being a chair on the NSERC evaluation committees for the past few years. And what's interesting there is the discussions are all about other kinds of impact people have and other ways of just demonstrating contributions to the, to the scientific record. So things like, our packages contributing an R package contributing you know um re pre-registered studies that aren't yet published all those things are now being considered as evidence of your um scientific excellence and your and your product productivity so so there's definitely a move i think to stop to kind of get away from this idea that it's just a publication in a high impact journal it's the only thing that matters in terms of, of that so i think there is i think everybody you know certainly in canada the tri councils are coming around to these ideas that you can incorporate these other new innovations into your grant proposals and they will be taken seriously so canada's you know doing well on that front i think okay i think that we might as well wrap up our first theme study design and planning and move on to the next one we're doing very well that will guarantee us to have adequate time to take questions from the audience at the end which is our our goal so with that uh, we're going to move to statistical pitfalls and uh, we can either feel if you don't mind you'll go first again is that okay sure yeah no problem. <clears throat> so yeah, that's statistical pitfalls, of course, a very important topic. Uh, uh, recommendations for early career. So p hacking does not work. So just leave that. Don't do that. Don't do the p hacking. It's much better to uh, carefully design your experiments and at best based on the clear hypothesis and consider which statistical tests will be applied before you start doing experiments. Uh, that's much better than p-hacking. OK, the robustness and appropriateness of statistical methods is uh, uh, 
difficult to evaluate, of course, but we have a three-level control in our journal. So first, you have the reviewers, which are always specialists in fields. They are asked for to do a review. So this is the first level of control is the, the, uh, the reviewer. Then you have the associate editor who will judge, will evaluate the reviewers and make a summarize, summarized review of, of, the whole, of the whole paper. So that's the second level. And, if necessary, and the third level is the, is the uh, editor-in-chief. Also, I always look also at the statistics of the papers. And if in doubt, I, uh, I ask uh, the authors or the, or the editors for, uh, for, uh, for, um, for uh, wait, that's for, yeah, I, I ask them to, 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 uh, to make it clear what they mean. And if it isn't, isn't done right, they have to redo it. And in serious cases, we ask a statistician. Statistician, we have an R code editor in our journal since a couple of years, and we always can ask him for the uh, complex complexity of statistics if they have done right, if they have done the right models, and so on. And he often interact directly with the authors to find the best solution for the data sets. So this, this are are. Uh, yeah, various levels to control uh, control that the statistics are done correctly and are robust. Uh, factors that are important to judge the ro robustness of the uh, statistics are, of course, the sample size and how pseudo replication is handled with. Thank you, okay. Theo. One more Louise? thing. Oh, yes, yes, go ahead. One more thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the statistical reporting issues, there are many issues that are not reported uh, correctly uh, in journals. So the first thing is one tail test. So these are not allowed, at least not in our journal, because in biology, you cannot exclude the uh, non-predicted direction. You cannot never exclude that. So what you can do is give one pro one direction a higher probability as the other direction so that is there is a paper by rising gains a very old paper 20 years of 30 years ago already 94 which uh, which deals with this problem and which calculates directed p values so one p, one uh, tilt values one tilt p values are cannot be published okay all, another problem is that people often give no uh, statistical details for non-significant results. That is not a good thing, I think. You get, should also give your statistical details for non-significant results, not only for the significant results. Uh, often the tables for complex, uh, for multivariate models are not complete. So you should give the model you, are working, you worked with and you should give all the details, estimates, standard errors, uh, degrees of freedom, and so on. And there should be clear statements in the methods about how you avoid pseudo replication because often that is not very, very clear. In, in models, it's, it's of course much easier to follow if you have an ID, uh, individual as an ID in the model or so, but uh, often it's not very clear. Okay, the statistical. Uh, I cannot say much about Bayesian statistics. I think it's a useful thing when the when the classical statistics or the frequency 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 statistic is cannot be applied. But otherwise, I would not recommend to to use another statistical methods uh, for your results. Okay, that's my contribution to this uh, this topic. Thank you, Theo. Thanks, Louis. Um, thanks. Uh, I would just. Well, yes, I would say that you know, the, the basic outline of the procedure there that is that Taylor decided is the same as uh, at Behavioral Ecology. And we also have a specialized statistical reviewer. If anyone's unsure, if the editor is unfamiliar or unsure, they can refer to the, to the statistics editor. Um, I think that, uh, and the other thing that, that we're trying to encourage is in many ways, statistical analysis can be more like an art than a science. Like if you go to our statistics professors here and say, how can we do this analysis? They say, oh, you can do it like this, you can do it like that, you can do it like this. You know, there, there isn't, and I think sometimes we think there's one 
absolutely correct way of doing things. And that's not necessarily always true. But what you need to ensure is that you are coming up with an appropriate way that answers the question you want to answer. And so we try not to get, we try to avoid people getting very adversarial in the review process and, and say, like, like, we are trying to come to an agreement about what the best way to do this might be. And, you know, there are, there are, there may be differing points of view on how a particular analysis gets done. I think sometimes a lot of that arises because people do not provide a good, clear description of their model structure. Um, and that is very, very important. Um, that that's that's one of the best things that you could do is a good, clear description of your model structure, the main effects, the how you're fitting this, whether you're fitting slopes and, and, and intercepts, description and justification for the for the construction of variables. Um, things like checking model fit are also very useful. Supplying the, the code for people to check. People reviewers particularly are very keen to see the to see our code these days as a way to to follow through the analyses. Um, so I think those are, are important things that you could do is just to really be very, very clear and as transparent as possible on the on the structure of your model. It makes all the difference to people following through on the results and exactly that report everything we need, you know, we need to know. And I would say in terms of what my perspective on the use of Bayesian statistics is, I'm all for it. We've, we've all gone full on Bayes in, in, in our lab. Um, and I think because it forces you to assess your confidence in your hypothesis um, and gives you estimates of both the magnitude of effects as well as the certainty around those estimates. And it can give you positive evidence if you have a lack of effect. It can say there really is nothing going on here, right? Um, and I, I think it gets you away. And it just it's just kind of the thing I was saying about the first thing. It, I think the danger of it is you don't want to get into just following a recipe, which I think is often the problem with a lot of statistical procedures. You just follow a recipe and then you take whatever's given and you say, right, this is this or that's that. And I think that a Bayesian analysis gets us to think about our data and our hypotheses in the right kind of way. Like, have we got a meaningful effect here? What is this showing us? How certain I am about this? How what how, how big is it? How how confident am I in it? And it helps you move along and it stops you becoming head up with like whether you've got uh, you know this notion of statistical significance. It pushes us back properly towards biological significance. So like that's my. That's my bid for why Bayesian analysis are a good thing and, and particularly useful in, in behavioural studies such as uh, we do. So that's me on that thing. Thank you, Louis. Rag, you're next. Yes, I have very similar things to say. Uh, first, I want to say that in PNS, we specifically ask every reviewer to tell us whether he or she feels confident in commenting on the statistics used, if not, whether we should consult a specialist statistical reviewer. So this is a question that every reviewer answers. And when the answer is that they don't feel confident and we have to ask somebody, we often do that. And that, in my experience, has been a very constructive process. That is, we don't get a specialist to help us to reject the paper, but we get a specialist to help us to improve the paper, often improve the understanding of the reviewer of the paper. So that has been a very useful thing in PNAs. The second thing I want to say is that too much emphasis on p-value results in the following situation. When people find that their pet hypothesis is rejected, they say it's almost significant because 0 0.06. And when their hypothesis they don't like is almost accepted, they say, but it's only 0 0.0.05. So you can see there's a conflict between what you think is biologically relevant and what is statistically relevant. And I think this is a this is a problem. So we should decide on an alpha level and then accept that. And then above that, you can say, however, even though this is only 0 0.06, I think this is an interesting idea. It needs to be further investigated rather than to say, I'd like to accept it, even though it is 0 0.06. So that is the, the third point I want to make is a fairly serious problem. As statistical methods are getting more complicated and our analysis is getting more complicated, we are getting away from understanding the logic of the statistics. There's a black box. You punch in something, you get out something, and then you accept what it says. Uh, in When I was a student, it was actually much simpler. I actually wrote my own computer programs to do all my statistical analysis, including ANOVA, which means I understood what ANOVA was. 
Today, that's become very hard and we need much more effort in terms of statistical training, even of professors, for us to understand what this black box is giving us. The, the distance between us, our mind and what the studies does has increased hugely. And this is a problem that we all have to find a solution to. Yeah, that's my contribution. Thank you, Rag. Wolfgang. Yeah. Um, so regarding the pressure to submit statistical significant results, I think I've built most of my career on publishing non-significant <laughs> results. And I think we should, we, should, we should emphasize that it's not the significant difference that is important. It's, it's, it's the question and it's whether we find a difference or not. And it's meaningful if we do not find differences. So, so I think this is really important. And the only backdraw is basically if you do not find a statistically significant difference between two groups or something like that. I mean, it needs to be based on a decent sample size. So that this, this could be one issue. But if it's based on a decent sample size, then this is a biologically meaningful result. And it should be, you should be able to publish it. And uh, so far, I, I, I got most of my non-significant results published, maybe not in Nature or PNAS, but at least in a decent behavioral journal. Um, regarding the, the data, the robustness of data, so we have a similar approach as others. Of course, we, the, the, the referees uh, judge the paper, and the ed, in, in our case, it's, it's so the editors are more free, so the, the editor-in-chief does not once once I give away a paper to one of the editors, it's fully in the hand of the editor. So they make the decision. Um, and in, in, in case the, the referees or the editor has problems with, with the statistics, then we ask a statistical referee uh, to judge the paper. We are also in the process of, of getting a data, uh, an editor for ethology that is specifically looking at data and stats, um, but this is an ongoing process. I don't know how long it will take until we get that. Regarding the statistical report or, yeah, something that I, with, with the stats, something that I find odd is, and, and I often have that with students that they, they get their data and they immediately do a statistical test can find a significant difference or something like that. And, and I often ask them, well, have you actually looked at the data? And I, I think this is, a, this is a really important process. Before you conduct any statistical test, just look at your data. And, 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 and usually, I mean, often you, you find a highly significant result. And if you look at the data, you do not see it. And this may be one indication that something with the test you did might might not be correct. So there might be, might be a mistake. So I, I think looking at the data, thinking about the data and how exactly to analyze them really, really helps. And if you don't, if you, if you have a highly significant result, but you don't see it in the data, there might be something wrong, most likely. Um, regarding the reporting, what I often find in submissions is that people are not very clear about the sample sizes. They're not very clear. I mean, they, they just provide p-values, but, but none of the other, um, I mean, Theo already mentioned it, none of the other <clears throat> important things that need to be mentioned. Um, effect sizes are often not mentioned. I think effect sizes are extremely important. Um, so these are things that people should 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 really look at. Um, I think nobody commented on the guidelines or recommendations regarding sample size, but I think that's that's an entirely difficult question, and that really differs whether you are working with Drosophila in the lab or with apes in the field. Um, so this is this is really hard. To address, and I think this is also, I mean, every referee, every editor will sort of take that into account in, in 
in his or her decision regarding the value of a paper. With regard to, to Bay, Bayesian stats or, or, or the, the frequentist stats, I, I personally have, similar to Louise, shifted to, to Bayesian stats because I find it, yeah, much more attractive because it's really focused on the hypotheses and the biological question. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a case on that. I mean, this should be, there are good reasons to use frequentist statistics. And I, I don't think that the journals should make a, a sort of a, a statement regarding which kind of stats has to be used for submissions. I'm taking, I look down, I was writing down, taking notes. Uh, thank you. So uh, we can take some time if, if you guys want to follow up on each other's comments, you have questions for each other to the editors before we open it up to the contributors. Maybe with the contributors will, Kaya, yes. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Wolfgang that often the descriptive statistics is missing. So people are doing only uh, analyzing statistics, but do not start with descriptive statistics. So we don't have an idea how long the wings are, only about the difference in wing size, but you don't know how the wings in the absolute size of the wings are. So these, these things are also important, especially when you want to compare papers with each other. You have to, you have to know the data the basic data of the uh, of the investigations. I just want to I just want to back up Wolfgang with his suggestion. That everyone look at their data. That's the first thing. Visualize your data always. And I think yeah, I find I, the one thing I sometimes found is sometimes students feel like it's cheating if you look at your data and decide what the you know like visualizing it and looking in it and then trying and then and then conducting the analysis it's sort of like well that isn't that cheating and it's just not i mean it, you know I, I find it very weird that, but i i do think that's how people sometimes think but you, the best thing you can do is visualize your data and also because we're very good at pattern detecting we have pattern detection if you have errors in your data you'll immediately see them at that point whereas you won't if you just you know if you if you graph something out if you if you just draw some pictures you'll immediately see the, whether you've got errors in your data set, what your data set looks like, the kinds of, of models you might want. I mean, it's just the most, I can't emphasize more that that was the most like absolutely important thing that Wolfgang has brought out there is that you should, you should look at your data first and foremost. <clears throat> Do we have a question from the contributors? Kaya. Um I was by, by the way, because, just in case, uh, I forgot to say that, but if, but if you guys want to introduce yourself, say say your name, well, your name's there, but your affiliation in case people join the meeting a couple of minutes after I, I mention it. Okay, Kaya Tombeck, postdoc at Hunter College and the junior fellow with the Simon Society of Fellows. Um, I was going to say basically exactly what uh, Theo just said about also publishing descriptive stats and just to put a bit more weight on that comment, um, it not only is good practice, um, and it helps people um, with, you know, meta analyses when they want to sort of get those uh, natural history data from various papers. But it also uh, is a good safeguard against the publication bias of negative results. Um, so I was recently doing a meta analysis on um, body size, sexual size dimorphism in um, mammals, and I noticed a very strong trend where if there wasn't a significant difference in body size, they would not publish the descriptive stats and I wouldn't be able to <laughs> add it to my analysis. But if there was a significant difference, then the, you know, the means and standard deviations were more often there. So uh, I think it just should be something that editors require and are strict about. Hi, Alba. I do have a question. Yep. Uh, hello, my name is Alba. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, so you mentioned uh, biological significance, like pretty much like you all agree about that, but do your journals have a specific guidelines or recommendations for reviewers to also be clear about that? <laughs> no. 
I have to confess, <laughs> but very good suggestion. Very yeah, that's good. good. I would I would bring it in. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a good. I'm gonna, it's, a, no it's a good suggestion. Yeah. Well, thank you for your honest questions. <laughs> Other questions from the contributors or the panelists? Do you have something to add to your colleagues' comments or a follow-up question? I mean, I guess... Oh, and to introduce myself, Facundo Fernandez Duque uh, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in Mark Halbert's lab and Allison Bell's lab. Um, it seems like everybody's on board for exploratory data analysis before getting started on the statistics. How would the editors feel about people reporting that when they submit their manuscript as a way for you to also take a preliminary look to see if there are any things that stand out to you. Because everything is also additional work, so. Did you mean it as part of the paper or did you mean it as a sort of initial foray into the, like how did you see it working? I think in a lot of cases it wouldn't need to be published. I would see it as more of like an initial filter for the editors and the reviewers to take a look at to see if something stands out to them in a similar sense that that you would submit the code or or more details on your statistics. Um, but yeah, as however you interpret it, I guess is more just to open <laughs> the discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think in a sense we need to follow Kaya's guidelines and recommendations, and everything should be in the paper. And there should be a descriptive, you know, uh, there should be a table of all the descriptive statistics and it should be included as a as standard, really, that that's what we want to see. And, and often you do see like people will begin their results with a sort of description of, of their sample and their, their base, you know, but like you say, it's very variable and sometimes you don't even realise that, I mean, I was not aware and now I think about it, I'm pretty sure I've seen that myself where, when you don't find a difference, you don't report the difference in, you know, the lack of difference, but you do report when there is. So, I mean, it's kind of very worthwhile keeping your eye out for these things. But, but I do think that really we want, we should have as much information as we can possibly get there. So to allow us to make our own minds up as well, you know, like we all, even though something's published and even though it's been peer reviewed, we all know there are there are flaws in that system and we all know that we have to keep our wits about us. So the, the better equipped you are as a, as a reader, once it's been published to, to, to see everything, the, I think that also speaks to keeping standards high and in, ensuring the integrity of the, of the scientific literature. So yeah, I'm all, all these suggestions are absolutely brilliant. I have a follow-up question on Alba's comment to, to the editors. So, uh, so you do see yourself. Maybe it's something that will get out will will come out of the panel. You do see yourself pondering seriously, uh, indicating the reviewers that they should be weighting biological significance much more than statistical significance. But for your journals, for the a very practical question is, does it need to be a suggestion? Can you ask the reviewers that the same way that they need to check on data sharing or, or some of the things that have been top down and we all do them? Uh, or or do, you, do you think that it could be something like, you need to do this, I wanna hear from you. Uh, I wanna hear from you making some statements about the biological significance of the findings. How, how do you envision this going for your specific journals? Yeah, that's an interesting. In DNS, it would be fairly straightforward because we actually have a checklist for reviewers and we can easily add one or two more boxes to that list because in addition to their written comments, there's a long check list of boxes that the reviewers have to tick. And so it would be easy to add this to that. It would be this. Although, of course, as I said, I'm one of more than 100 editors, so whether they would agree or not is a different question, but we can keep on revising these checklists that the reviewers get. And those checklists are very useful for the editor rather than for the author. 
Theo, you were going to say something? Add something? Yeah, I think that would be also a good addition to the checklist to have the biological meaning of the results. Uh, we now have uh, obligatory data, uh, data, uh, data. You have to provide the data to the journal nowadays in, in, in behavioral ecology and social biology. So, but of course, it's difficult to check to check yourself the data and, 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 and extract the, uh, the relevant information from that. So it would be good in the papers to have an, an, a section of descriptive statistics, I think. The data nowadays in our journal are, are edits, it's obligatory, and reviewers are asked to look at the data if they are well well organized and, com and, and, and comprehensible, so they can read the variable names and all these kind of things. So that's nowadays standard in our journal. But uh, I, I agree with Rock. That, uh, I agree with Rock that um, that such a such a such a list is might be really helpful. And if you add the biological significance to that list, you make the referees think about the relevance of the biological difference that, that we are looking at. So I think you probably cannot do much more than hinting the, the referees to something like that. And I think with such a list, um, that might be a good way. We do not have such a list at the moment for ethology. I mean, I've been thinking about generating a list uh, to ask referees certain kind of questions. I mean, there, there are, of course, questions in the in the in the form in the submission or in the yeah in the submission form for the referees but but not such a specific list but that would be probably a good idea to to add something like that and also in ethology we now have obligate it's obligatory to submit the data to the journal i think the the prut case made us all very aware that the data should be available I wanna, I try not to keep an eye on the chatting because if I do, I cannot multitask, I cannot listen to you, but I think that we're just hearing from Ron Wasserstein, who is the executive director of the American Statistical Association. You may know Wasserstein from the statement that the society published in 2016 and 2019, and Ron and I have been talking a lot about this. So he has a suggestion there in the chatting window that I invite you then to, to check out. If somebody helps me, I'll try to save the chatting and make it available. I understand that sometimes there are very valuable comments by, by the audience in the chatting window. I just cannot keep my eyes on that as well as, as listening to you. So uh, with that, I think we, we should move on, on to our last theme. And actually the, the, last, the last few questions were really touching on institutional change, right? Where we're talking about what the journals can or cannot do. So we were transitioning in a way to, to our last theme, which is institutional change. For, for, a, for the change then, uh, we, we need not go in alphabetical order uh, unless Theo is ready to go. But if somebody wants to go first, we can, oh, we can mix and match. Okay. Theo, that's okay. Theo, you wanna go? Yeah, okay, okay. Okay. So uh, we have a relatively uh, big editorial board. We have about 60 editors or, and that's, an advantage because you cannot give the editors too much uh, manuscripts at the same time. So we give them one to two to three maximally uh, manuscript to handle at, at, at one moment. So that's, I think that's advantageous to have that many. Uh, we recruit our editors in different ways. So there is self-application. We always will uh, look at that in detail if it is, uh, if it is possible to recruit someone from self-application, but normally we, we uh, ask for editors, uh, maybe uh, by recommendation of the, the previous editor or by looking for edit uh, editors uh, based on their, uh, on their field, of, uh, field of interest. And of course, uh, about the uh, uh, publication record. So we, we take editors which are uh, senior senior editors, but also postdocs in an advanced stage. So we do not start with PhD editors, but 
it must be a poster editor in an advanced state up to senior authors, uh, senior editors. Um, we have nowadays, so the, change, the things we change in the journal, I'm uh, editor in chief since 2011, together with James Traniello. He, he's looking for the invertebrate manuscript. I'm looking for the vertebrate manuscript. And things we changed, things we are there, is that we have uh, an editor now for our code, uh, for our code, Esteban Fernandez Jurikic. He is, uh, he is uh, looking for that, so he is he's giving us statistical advice. Uh, we introduced that you have to uh, as to record if you have taken the uh, record and the analysis if they have done blind, which is also important, I think, for future uh, meta analysis and so on. Uh, we have a mandatory data availability since 2020. Uh, we have what's also an important thing is we have continuous article publishing, so CAP. So that means that as soon as your article has been accepted, you, you get an, a, a, a DOI number, a dot infantile number. So it can be, it can be it's, it's, it's in, in, a, in a form that can be, uh, that can be cited. You, you don't have to wait till the journal has been, it will be published. This, so you have a continuous article publishing, which is beneficial for the authors, I think. Uh, further things we introduced that color images are for free. Uh, you don't need to worry about formatting, uh, so you, you don't, uh, the, the literature list and uh, tables and figures can be included in the text, though that comes in the last step that that must be uh, done correctly if your paper will be accepted. And we invited and we introduced in a few new uh, uh, things like invited refuse and editor's choice, so these are a couple of things we uh, introduced since we are uh, managing the journal. We have, we don't, with such a big uh, editorial board, we don't have uh, uh, meetings with our boards, but we have meetings, uh, we have regular contact between the chief editors, of course, and we have regular uh, meetings with Plinger, with, with the publisher about uh, strategies, about uh, how the, how the, how the, uh, how the uh, journal is running, how we can uh, change it, how we can improve it, and so on. So that is every year we have a, a meeting uh, with, uh, with, with, our, with the people and the, the publisher we are responsible for the journal and, and the assistance. And now, of course, we have an editorial assistant also who is uh, taking a lot of uh, work from us uh, about problems in all kinds of problems during the publication process, during the review process. It's, it is done by an editorial assistant. Otherwise, it would be too much uh, because we are publishing uh, so 400 papers, 400 submissions a year, and uh, publish about 200 papers, I think. So that's my contribution to this Thank you. topic. Thank you, Theo. Luis? <clears throat> Thanks again, Eduardo. Um, yeah. Uh, very similar in many ways. Um, you know, the first question, how do you balance data accessibility and code with authors' intellectual rights? Um, so there, I think the thing, I, our policy is that we, you know, you, you, want, you want people to be able to reproduce those results. You want people to be able to check and reproduce those results. And that's, that's what's needed, right? So because you don't want people to just hand over hard-won data, um, you know, particularly field data, necessarily that other people could then use. But I mean, that has happened, I mean, I would say that's happened to, in our work that we supplied a data set and then somebody else used it in, a, in another analysis and they got in touch and gave us an acknowledgement and asked us about it. So, I mean, again, it comes down to, to individual people doing the right thing and, you know, you know um, acknowledging that they are drawing on other people's data. So I don't, I think that you can generate certain kinds of norms around, I mean, maybe we, you know, these aren't things that we've necessarily had to do before or we've thought about before but but I think it's possible to generate norms of behavior that we all agree that should be adhered to and maybe they don't necessarily need to be written down per se because we all adhere to certain kinds of norms and it could be the case that you know you recognize that but generally you just have to supply the data needed to reproduce the results reported in the paper 
Um, uh, and then we have to, you have to store your data. You have to upload that data to a, to a repository that is public, that is secure, and that is permanent. And that's our requirement. So it doesn't matter where that is, but OUP, um, Oxford University Press, um, subsidizes the use of Dryad, which is a data repository. So you, you normally have to pay. If you publish in behavioral ecology, OUP will cover the cost of that for you. So nobody needs to. So if you want to use Dryad, you can, and it doesn't cost you anything. But equally, if you want to use another public repository, you can. That's fine. It just has to be permanent, public, and, and secure. Um, so that's the that's the that's that issue. And then I would say um, the way again, the way we choose editors is. People, the editors suggest people who have been very good reviewers, constructive, you know, um, uh, that have made good suggestions that haven't just demand, you know, the thing about being a good reviewer is you have to accept that people are writing the paper that they want to write and not the paper that you wanted them to write. So all these kinds of things are looked for. So then um, we ask, I ask, uh, the editors to give me up their suggestions. So that can be people who they've come across and they thought have done a particularly good job of reviewing or people that they know in other domains in that, that sense. And then we have a board of editors, so there's 11 editors and they are the associate editors, they are handling editors. And then we have an editorial board that are basically people who have committed to doing at least 10 peer reviews per year and will do them in an expedited fashion because getting reviewers is a big tough job these days. And so we don't want authors to be hanging around, hanging around. And so if we are, if a reviewer is overdue and very late, or if we cannot get a reviewer in a particular area, we have an editorial board that we can call on and say, can you do this in a week? And will you do it in this? And so that's where post, like the more junior PhD, early postdoc type people are, are recruited. And that's a good, that's a good launch pad for becoming an editor subsequently. It's a good way to, to get a feel for it, see if you like it, having a bit more, because um, sometimes you're also called upon to adjudicate a decision. So if there's very di you know, diametrically opposed reviewer reports and the editor, it's not particularly their field, they can call on an editorial board member in that area to um, give their opinion and to adjudicate on that, on that decision. So choosing editors, it's a matter of finding people who would do a good job, who are good, constructive, um, offer timely, detailed, constructive reviews, and we also make sure that we cover all the areas that, that behavioral ecology receives papers in. So it's, um, you, it's it's not a sort of mechanical process. There's a lot of discussion, and then we and then we come up with a list, and then everyone votes on it, and then we then we have a ranked order of people that we and then I approach them and ask them and explain the role and ask if they'd like to to accept it. So if you want, if you're interested in these things, you know, the, 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 it's also the case that we, you know, people want to be considered as an editorial board member. We, we welcome, um, you know, inquiries of that kind. We're happy to, the other thing that we will do if you're a young person, if you're a early career researcher is if you would like feedback on your review, I, you submit a review and you want, we, you can ask me and I will let, and I will discuss with the editor and then we can give you you know, our view of, of, of what your review is like and the kind of ways you could perhaps, areas you could emphasize, what we're doing well, what you what you might not want to do so much of. Um, so yeah, if you want if you want that kind of feedback, because we're, we're very keen to improve the quality of peer review as well as much as we can. So that's the thing we offer as well. Thank you, Louise. Rag, you're next. Yes, so in this uh, final theme of institutional change, I want to flag two points, but I want to do it very differently. I don't want to say what we are doing or what we should be doing. Uh, I know that young people have put this panel together and they want advice from us, but I don't think we have all the wisdom that is required to give advice. And I want to flag two issues for the young people to think about, because tomorrow you will be the editors, you will be the reviewers. So I want to throw open two open questions for you to think about and maybe advise us. One uh, is a problem that I have faced throughout my career as an author and for the more recent part of my career as a junior editor in a hierarchy of editors. And this is what is the role of the editor? Typically, an editor is a postman 
takes the manuscript from the author, gives it to the reviewer, takes the comment from the reviewer and gives it back to the author. And the underlying philosophy is that the reviewer is always right. And this, I think, is completely uh, uh, incorrect. And so the editor has to play a much more act. So in fact, I don't like the word referee. A reviewer is not a referee. Who, who, a referee the editor is a referee. A reviewer gives comments and the editor says, here is an author, here is a reviewer, and I am the referee, and I must decide who is right. Because most authors are reviewers and most reviewers are authors. It cannot be that every time I am a reviewer, I wear the reviewer's hat, I'm right, and when I wear the author's hat, I'm wrong. So I think we need to strengthen the position of the editor. I've had this problem as an author. I even have, a, have this problem as a junior editor because my boss tells me, no, 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 unless all the reviewers say, yes, you cannot accept a paper. I said, then why do you need me? So this is something we need all to think about. What is the role of an editor? So this is an open question. I want young people to think about it. The other point I want to flag is one of the big institutional changes that I'm seeing now, very welcome change, is to find ways of getting papers, submissions from underrepresented people. This could be women, this could be young people, early career researchers, or in fields that are not well represented. And the way we do this is we have special calls, we make requests, we invite people, wonderful. But the problem is we work in a system where a large fraction of the papers are rejected at the desk without being sent out for review. But it doesn't make sense that you invite someone to submit and then you reject it without review. So now how do we deal with this situation? How do we be fair to everybody? How do we encourage diversity? This is not an easy uh, problem. And I certainly don't have the wisdom to advise young people. And I like young people to think about it. How do we increase the uh, representation of minorities of all kinds, including disciplinary minority, and yet deal with the large number of submissions that we get? These are two things which I need, I think we all need to think about. Thank you, Rag. Wolfgang, you're next. Yeah, I, th I think Rag made an important point about the editor. I mean, I, I won't name the journal now, but I mean the, well, the journal group now, but there are some journals where the editor is basically only sort of, yeah, the postman, as Louisa just mentioned in the, in the chat, the postman be between the author and the referee, and, and the postman has to send the manuscript between referee and author until they finally agree that it can be published. And I think this is a, this is a, a not, not a good situation. So the editor should be really in charge and have a strong position there. Um, to, to comment on the editors, so this may be different for ethology than for the other journals. So we are published by Wiley and Wiley actually pays the editors. So we have a small number of editors that, that get three-year contracts and they are paid for these contracts. And uh, so it's, it's, and I'm actually the youngest. So I'm, I'm the editor in chief, but I'm the youngest editor. So all the other editors have been there before me and they have some of them for a longer time, some of them for shorter times, but all of them are experienced uh, Ex experienced researchers and I, I would, yeah, it would be nice to have some younger people in the editorial board, but for ethology, this is difficult because we are a small journal and our, our editor group of editors have also because they are paid, it has to be a small group. So we cannot have 60 editors or something like that. Um, we are soon, hopefully, we are still in negotiating with Wiley, um, hiring a data editor and I hope that we can hire a younger person there. Um, but this is a bit different, but also similar to the other journals, we have an editorial board and very similar to behavioral ecology, we mainly address our, behavior, our editorial board members um, when we urgently need a, a review that because we didn't get feedback from, from invited referees or because we cannot find referees for a particular paper, things like that. Um, 
yeah, regarding, I mean, nobody, yeah, there is this question regarding the, how do you handle cases where authors use non-standard statistical methods or approaches? Um, yeah, this is, this is something where you, you often consult a statistical referee and, and we have some of those in our editorial board. And in the future, I hope that our data editor can be can be sort of in charge for these kind of manuscripts. Um, what has changed since I uh, became editor in chief of ethology? I think I'm doing that now for five years or almost five years. Um, so we have invented or not invented we have we have uh, started to have similar to as Theo said so there is a free submission you do not have to follow the the guidelines of the journal if you submit a, a paper I think this this is something that really has as an author I, I found that uh, really I mean, it's a disaster because I mean, you you submit to a journal and you get rejected. You have to re you spend a day or two to reformat your manuscript to submit it to a different journal. I mean, this is such a waste of time. And and nowadays there are really easy methods where this can automatically imp implement it. So with ethology now, I mean, this really seems to work. So you don't even have to do that with the last submission. It's automatically done. So, so in the end, there is a there's an algorithm that runs it, and of course, that needs some checking during the during the um, during the final. I mean, when you review the the final version of the of the manuscript, um, when you read the proofs. Um, but I really think this is a big step forward. That as an author, you don't have to worry about all this crazy formatting guidelines. I mean, I, I, I mean, it would be best if we would all agree on one formatting guideline. And I think behavioral ecology and BS are pretty good in the formatting. I really like that format. I tried to, in, in, to, to sort of get the same literature format for ethology, but Wiley seems to not be able to accept this kind of format. <laughs> um, um, but I think this is a big and important step. I mean, it's a waste of our time to reformat manuscripts all the time. So this was a big change. Um, we have these pre-registration studies that are not very well, well, as I said, no single submission so far. So this is something we have recently implemented. And we have implemented a sort of special kind of review that is called species in the spotlight, where you sort of highlight the importance of a particular species for a, for a scientific question. So it's it's not about just publish anything that you never wanted to know or that others never wanted to know about a particular species, but just publish something about a species, why this species has been important for the particular field in, in behavioral research. And this specifically also addresses introductions of thesis because in, 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 in many PhD theses, people introduce their study subject and all the background of that. And then this is sort of something that you could target with a species in the spotlight article. But now I'm sort of, in the <laughs> in the mood of sort of yeah i'm done <laughs> thank you very much one very quick comment i don't think wiley wants you to make it easy to transfer to another journal so the more for anything that makes it easier for us to move between journals it means moving between publishers once you're there they want you there they can no, it's just they, they, I think it's a technical issue because they cannot combine their, their, the formats they have. They, so for instance, I can have the literature list in the form of behavioral ecology or BES, but only in combination with numbered references in the text. And I hate numbered references because again, as an author, 
if you have numbered references and if you if you i mean of course we we all use these these referencing tools um like endnote or whatever um but of course at some stage there's always a manual process especially at the end of the formatting and if you revise a paper and you have to revise these numbered references in the text it's a nightmare i hate it so i don't want this combination with having elegantly formatted literature lists, which avoids too many, like, I mean, if you look at the literature list of, of, of ethology, there are so many dots and commas and whatever. I, I, I don't like it. I really like the very simple form you have in behavioral ecology or BES. Only the necessary punctuations and, and nothing else. I really like that. So we could have it for ethology, but only in combination with the numbered references in the text. And I don't like that. Nobody could explain to me why this is so, but this is how it is. And I have to deal with it. But the good thing is we have this automated process. So you just submit your paper as it is, and it will automatically be formatted in the weird way that Wiley prefers it to be. Thank you. So following on your advice, all four of you, I'm not going to play postman and just go from one speaker to the next, but I'll make decisions. And I think that in, in virtue of the time, I suggest we skip the few minutes we've been using for having you guys talk among yourself and see if we have a, one or two questions from the contributors. And then we really want to open the floor to our community. I think that that we I'm I'm sure that I'm speaking for everyone uh, when I say that we want to do that. So, do we have anything from the contributors? If not, we'll start yeah. taking questions from. I have one addition. Yes, yes Can Theo, one addition. When we ask uh, new editors, we give priority to minorities. So, priority to, to females because we have a male biased editorial board, which most editorial boards have. So, we with equal of with equal. Uh, Qualifications, we give priority to females and we give priority to people from uh, minor countries or continents which are in a minority like Asia, Africa, and South America. So that's what it, I wanted it, to say. Is it the case that you have a female bias editorial board in your journal? It isn't the case at all in all primary journals. All primary journals are remarkably Probably, yeah. female Probably. bias. We have 30% uh, females, I think, in our editorial board. We want to improve that. It's, it's exactly like that, but the other direction in all, in all four primary journals. Yeah. Any questions? I think that Kaya, you raise your hand. Yeah, it just strikes me that, um, I mean, all of these themes are interrelated, but um, I was, I mean, I was very struck by Wolfgang's comment that they hadn't received a single submission for pre-registration. Um, and I kind of assumed that, you know, it's not something I had the bandwidth for, but people were doing and it was good, and, <laughs> you know, but I think that now that as we're talking about institutional change also, um, I mean, I get that it can be a time suck. it's more workload, you know, for researchers and for editors, but it might actually have be also a good opportunity, actually, especially for early career researchers, let's say you're starting off as a grad student, um, and I mean, it does involve the negotiation between the student and the PI also. The PI is going to play a role in kind of getting, a, you know, the design process and the planning um, with the student going so that it's ready for pre-submission or pre-registration, et cetera, and uh, needs to be willing to do that. Um, but that does strike me as an opportunity because it's hard as a, you know, um, early grad student, especially to come across a big idea that's going to, you know, be a big thing right away. Um, and I think that there's opportunity here for PIs and editors and everybody to encourage uh, people that are starting off to do, you know, start off with a replicate study, do a pre-registration think of, to get you thinking about study design, et cetera. And then you have, you can do it and then not wait. You know, you can still go to the field and wait for the the comments to come back and for feedback, but it, it's likely that some part of your design is like the, you know, the core of it's probably still good and you can do some modifications as you go, but it gives you a little bit of kernel of, you know, like um, validity early on that you have a venue to get your first papers in. Um, and I think that might actually be a game changer for especially early career researchers. So that's something to think about for 
editors and also for PIs or people that are about to be PIs. Just, uh, yeah, a thought. Thank you, Kaya. Well, I want to thank all four panelists. I, I think that I'm speaking for everyone. It's been fantastic. And now we want to take questions from the audience for those who join us maybe a couple of minutes after we started. I would like, like we always do in fine, that you type a question mark in the chatting window. If you are a student or a postdoc, please type the question mark and you can type SP. And always uh, introduce yourself if you can state your name and your affiliation. And that way we, I can give priority to uh, the students and the postdocs. This was a panel imagined, developed uh, by, by young colleagues, young scholars. And so the young scholars will take priority in addressing the editors. So with that, of course, where I, I see all kinds of, of uh, thanks and congratulations to the panelists, uh, I, I share on that, it's been fantastic. And I invite you to submit Questions or, 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 yeah, in the chatting window, if anybody has one. Do, can somebody help me keep an eye on the YouTube community? Yeah, or I'll keep my eye there. on YouTube. Okay. Uh, okay, while we wait, uh, if I, I don't see question marks, I'll go ahead. Uh, something that combines study design with statistical pitfalls. How are you, what, what, what are your reactions to the situation so many of us face that even when we understand the importance of effect size, we just sometimes we have no clue about what a biologically relevant effect size would be for the questions we're asking or the outcome variables we're measuring. If, I mean, any, all the time, we just don't know because we don't know the system enough. So how, how do we navigate those two things also related to power analysis? Because for power analysis, well, I need to have some idea of what the effect size I gather it's important to understand the system I'm studying, but sometimes we just don't know. Theo? Oh, I thought well, yeah. Well, the problem nowadays, in, in the early days of behavior ecology, the, the experiments was, were much more theory driven. There was much more testing of theories, which is nowadays much less. So, and therefore, it's much, much good. It's not so easy to estimate make the biological significance of the results. If you are testing a theory, then it's, it's much easier to 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 uh, to look the direction in which your results would go, but if if you don't have an a, a, an underlying theory, then it is much more difficult to 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 judge the biological significance. I think well, there is a question from a student, uh, da David. Hi, yeah, uh, very much along the same lines as Eduardo's question. I uh, am curious. I guess specifically to hear from Louise and Wolfgang about the use of, of Bayesian analysis. Um, I'm not super familiar with it. I've never used it before. And I'm very intimidated to try to really dive into the literature to try to figure out, especially uh, in terms of assessing the use of priors and how informative a prior is, how much confidence I have in a prior, how to kind of divine one if there's not a ton of relevant literature in a, in a topic and how sensitive my final analysis will be based off of the various errors I can make assessing the prior. Well, I would just, I would suggest uh, reading Richard McCowry's book, um, which is an excellent resource for everybody. He also has his lectures online um, and those are excellent. And I would say, you've just got to give it a bash and not be intimidated by these things. And remember that they are tools for us to use and you know we are in charge. Um, and I, I would also say that in terms of priors, that- um, Can you put the name of that book in the chat? Can you put- uh, if, I could if, if I could remember it, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Rethinking. Something else. I'll, I'll look it up. Statistical rethinking, I think. Statistical uh, rethinking. Statistical, thanks, Albert. Statistical rethinking. That's it. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to get it wrong. That's why I would. 
Um, but I would say um, in terms of priors, often, you know, you can have an informative or weekly informative priors because you're right. You don't want to set a prior that's going to, you know, because then that means you're already, you're, you're, you're really putting your thumb on the scale. But weekly informative, you know, most of our analysis involve weekly informative priors. Um, and I think, I mean, the thing you're, I think the thing, the, once you have a go at it and play around with it, I think you just have to read into it and understand what it is. Because, I mean, I also think some of the comments previously, like, it's not that um, you shouldn't ever use frequentist analyses or that, you know, I think I think it's it's a sense of understanding what might be the most useful for the questions you're interested in, the kind of system you're working with, how much you know about it, like the kinds of studies you're doing. It's very useful for people like me who work with observate complex hierarchical observational data, um, you know, and where I am interested in understanding something about the the the, mag the magnitude of effect and, and and knowing something about how certain we can be and you know those kinds of things because often they are quite it's useful for, for exploratory analyses um in that sense so i would say don't be intimidated and you know have a go but also just remember like you know the one thing you don't want to do is ever just use something like a recipe and you shouldn't be using any any statistics like that so i think it's it's something to to master in a sense of really understanding what you're doing and why. And and I would say again, you know, statistical rethinking is, a, is an excellent introduction to all of this and to that particular way of thinking about. It's just a different way of thinking about your data. If nothing else, even if you don't use Bayesian analysis in the end, I do think it's really helpful to to, to understand the, the the nature of the thinking that goes in because it does give you a little shift in perspective on how you can approach data analysis more generally. And it's just valuable to know about whether you use it or not. Yeah, along along the same lines. Don't don't be afraid. I mean, it's not it's not rocket science. It's <laughs> it's it's just another method. And and I think there are good introductions. I mean, I I learned a lot from Franzi Corner Nievergeld, who also has written a book on Bayesian analysis. Um, so can, I, can you can you type the name or or say say again slower? I I type it in the in the in the okay. in the comment later on. So it's it's all doable. And and I recently attended a workshop and I really liked the message of that workshop because that workshop was mainly by two statisticians who use Bayesian methods. Then the the question of one participant was ah you know I mean. I, I'm writing a paper and I, I would like to use Bayesian methods, but for this problem, I cannot find a, a Bayesian, Bayesian version of the test. And there's only the frequentist test. And those guys said something that, that I found very helpful also for my, my own research. They said, well, why don't you, you shouldn't be so strict about it. I mean, if you don't have a Bayesian test for it, just use the frequentist test. You shouldn't be so, 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 I mean, there are these, you know, there are these fights between some people. You have to use Bayesian, you have to use frequentist. You should be much more, I mean, these are just methods to look at your data. And, and, and most of the time they will also provide you with similar results. I mean, it would be scary if you if you use a Bayesian method and you find completely different results than if you use a, a frequentist method. So 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 that would scare the hell out of me if 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 I would find such a big difference. So I I would be very open to that and also combine methods, but it's it's not rocket science, it's it's doable. And I, well, I think these these books might help. I'd also say that. Comment? Sorry, sorry, Eduardo. I was just going to say another thing that sort of addresses your question previously about is is in Richard's book he has this thing about directed acyclic graphs, like how you can work out how variables relate to each other and come up with a sort of um, so then you can structure your models better regardless of what you know. And um, I think that gets at the issue you're approaching to do with biological significance. If you make use of DAGs and have a good understanding of how you think different variables might affect each other, I think that might also help you think about what the likely um, effect size you might expect to see, given the number of inter given the number of variables, given the structure of your, you know, given the complexity of the issue, given the, 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 the structure of your DAG. So that's another, just, just, the, just the stuff on DAGs alone is worth the price of the show. 
I, I wanted to comment, and I, I, I think Ron Wasserstein is still here, so maybe he'll correct me, but I, I, I don't think that the, the issues that we hear a lot about are not with whether you take a frequentist approach to making statistical inference. What, what I have a hard time still understanding that has almost any value in the kind of research that we do in behavioral sciences is statistical significance and the use of an arbitrary cutoff for making decisions. Those are two very different things. Nobody's saying don't explore, and, and like you just were saying, Wolfman, don't, don't use a frequentist approach to start pondering your questions where people, including myself from my limited understanding, have a lot of problems, is with you using statistical significance for just making a cutoff, correct on this side, incorrect on that one. That is very different. You can take a frequentist approach where you develop creative, well-informed hypotheses that are not, I think this was, uh, this is alluding to Ron's comment in the chatting, uh, where really these hypotheses are not, not the null, you don't automatically set up a null, but you set up hypotheses, alternatives that are informed by your understanding of the system. So no to an arbitrary cutoff for making a statistical significance claim. Nobody's saying no to a frequencies approach, but, but I, this is how, as I am understanding it, as I, as I almost preach it to my students, but I'm sure Ron will correct me and others may correct me as well if I'm not getting it right. I agree with that, uh, absolutely, Eduardo. And I would just add um, that multiple approaches to analyzing data are always valuable. Uh, locking yourself into one way of thinking about it or one model is not necessarily the best approach. Thank you. Again, because of these multiple approaches, I, and this is just in case you want to check it, there was this paper that I learned about in a course I did with Ashley Steele, S-T-E-L, where they gave the same data set to 70, 70 data analysis teams. These were statisticians, and they told them, this is the question we have. You are all getting the same data set. Choose how you want to analyze it. Well, you can imagine how it ended up. I mean, there, it was a huge range of variation in the approach they took to analyze it. When they got reviewers, they changed that approach. It's a fantastic p and article if you want to understand that. Yes, you can analyze it any way you want, and that, that's as wide as going to be the range of answers you get sometimes. The questions, do we, I don't see questions in the chat and people are being, Christina. Yes, Christina Nora, your turn. Thank you very much. I'm Christina, I'm a postdoc at UC Davis. Um, I came in kind of late, so forgive me if, I, if this has already been discussed, but I was curious on the panelists' opinions on exploratory analyses. Um, so analyses that do not specifically test on hypotheses. I've had success in papers of my own doing it this way. But I've recently reviewed a paper where the authors were trying to attempt an exploratory analysis. One of the reviewers said, you need to state your hypotheses and what you're testing. The editor came back and told them that they needed to state their hypotheses, which I found kind of troubling because if it was truly exploratory, they already knew the results and then had to go back and, 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 and say some sort of hypothesis. So I was curious about um, the um, editor's um, feelings or thoughts or experiences with truly exploratory analyses that don't have clear, explicit hypotheses to be tested and, and the success of those papers at your journals. We, have we spoke about that and many of us felt that exploratory analysis is very important and we need to bring about, this is maybe one of the institutional changes that we need to bring about, especially in our field, natural history and exploratory analysis are very important and we need to change the mindset of, of people who think that every time you test a hypothesis, that is good science and everything else is just preliminary. This has to change. And it's not, it's for sure not good scientific practice to sort of come up with a hypothesis after having sort of done an exploratory analysis. I think we should be, we should be really honest about that. I mean, if we have no clear idea, if we just, I mean, this is, 
I mean, probably most of us, at least I'm, I'm really driven by this curiosity. I, I want to see how nature works. And, and I, I mean, this, this is often you just look at things and you wonder what's going on. And then you, you collect some data and you publish that. And after having collected those, <coughs> sorry, those data, you can come up with hypotheses. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Kaya. You're next. Uh, we don't hear you, Kaya. Yeah. I was while while I was listening, I was trying to find this paper. I know Valentin Ambrain is the second author. They, they had a paper in oh gee, Journal of Evolutionary Biology. I think I'll post in the chat where they discuss. I mean, they, they really challenge this idea that we're all, their claim is that most of us claiming to do hypothesis testing were not. And most of our hypotheses are not because we don't know enough about the system to really formulate hypotheses that are explanatory enough to merit. I mean, you cannot really derive, logically derive predictions out of this hypothesis because we don't know the system enough. And he's all for saying most of what we're doing is truly exploratory and we're disguising it for whatever reason as hypothesis testing when the hypothesis that we have cannot be tested. They're, they're general hypotheses. Uh, so can I respond really quickly? Yeah. I yeah, did I did defend the authors in the, in that review and, and I, there's a paper by um, Andrew Gelman, I think it's called something like the top or the five most important changes in statistical analyses or recent advances in statistical analyses and one of them is exploratory analysis um, in that paper so I can find that and post that in the chat but that um, the uh, the they did the editor did change and, and, and agree that the exploratory analysis was, was perfectly acceptable. Good, good for you. Kaya, you were, no, something happened with your system because we we were hearing you before. Yeah. Try again? Um, yes, yeah. yes, now we can hear you, yes. All right, thanks, sorry. Um, uh, this is moving a little bit away from stats, but Rag brought up a really important point about improving the diversity of submissions. Um, and the diversity of uh, authors published. And I am curious to know whether any of the other journals have um, specific policies or practices to really try to increase diversity of not just you know, your submissions, but also somehow facilitate careful consideration of papers from a diversity of authors. Um, and also I'm curious if you have specific um, approaches or are discussing how to allow for new tools like ChatGPT to sort of, um, you know, al allow for a facilitation, at least when it comes to a language barrier, you know, is, is there some opening there for it to, to actually be used for good in science? Um, I could just say that we also, as a, for our editorial board, we also try to ensure a diversity of representation, you know, in terms of area of the world, as well as things like gender and those kinds of things. So we are, you know, those those all factor in. <clears throat> I mean, one thing I will say that I I'm trying to improve. But I'm only I've only I only took over at Bay Haver Ecology last August, July August, um, and before prior to that, previously a few years previously, I was the um, executive editor of Animal Behaviour for the European Office, and at Animal Behaviour they offer a full-on excellent copy editing service of your, of your paper. Angela Turner does a great job and she also puts it in house style, but she also does an excellent copy editing service generally. And we don't, we don't seem to have quite that a behavioral ecology. And I think that is one of the barriers to non-English speakers that, you know, the, because often in, I've seen this for some other journals who I also won't name in the kind of, in the way that Wolfgang didn't name Frontiers. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> we all know that's what it was. Um, but I mean, certain other journals don't have 
uh, they they put it back on the authors and they said the English needs attention, you know, get it sorted out. That costs money. If you, you know, and I think that's wrong because it, 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 it it's, a, it's a genuine barrier. We should we should have tried to avoid that. So in that sense, I'm hoping that we can improve the copy editing people receive because I think people don't, people sort of think of it as a kind of luxury, but it's really not. If you think about the fact that English is the language of science and we need to make sure that people can, can publish in that language, despite the fact it's not their first language. And then I, I do see I do see areas where you can then where chat GPT might be very useful in precisely the way you suggested, in the sense that it allows people to produce well-written, legible, clearly written English. Um, and I know that some people have said, I've heard some scientists say, you know, they've, they've used it to sort of mock up a kind of quick methods um, section that they can, that they then adjusted in a, because that seems to be kind of quite programmatic and it's like, you know, you're dealing with your own methods. And so I, I do see that, I do think we have to use it as a tool and make the most of it. It's not going to go away, is it? We can't pretend it's going to go away. And I do think there is ways in which we can use it. We can use it for good and not evil. And um, we just need to work out how best to do that. But I do see it as a way to help reduce barriers of that kind. Absolutely. Yeah, the same is true for BFE quality in social biology. Uh, so Springer is offering uh, copy editing, but it's not for free, I think. So that's that's a shame. Yeah, I agree. Another issue is that when you are not certain that your article, that your manuscript would fit in the journal, you are always free to submit an abstract to let us judge if that, if that is, uh, is that a good topic for the journal. So that's always a possibility. Just send your abstract to me and uh, we will judge if it is uh, okay for reviewing. I mean, that goes back to another comment I think Ralph made where he said, uh, you know, there's a lot of desk rejection. And I think, I mean, often desk rejection comes about because people are just sending it to completely the wrong journal. You know, we get sent things that just are not for us. And, you know, we that's a way to, you know, you just, there's just nothing you can do. They're like psychology, they're psychology papers or, yeah. you know, they're just not the right journal. So, I mean, that's where a lot of desk rejection comes from. And, and I, I think that's, I think that's kind of appropriate and right rather than, um, you know, because it's otherwise you're just wasting everyone's time. But the situation is very different for journals like BNAS, where it is inevitable that a large fraction are desk rejections, even though they are sort of appropriate in the general sense, because the number of submissions are so much more than what we can accept. And that's where the, we have, a, we have a, a incompatibility with efforts to have diversity and treat everybody in the same way. There's this huge incompatibility between these. Because when you invite people, it makes no sense to reject at the desk. But then if you give them special treatment, then the other people feel that, you know, so it's, it's a big mess. We have to decide how to deal with it. Yeah, just to add, also at Wiley, there is a copy editing service but it's also not for free, which is a shame. I, I really think <clears throat> these these kind of services should be should be for free. And yeah, with regard to desk rejections, so we also have quite a number of desk rejections, but this could be easily avoided by people if they would frame. Like, I mean, I I often have the impression that people do not really target the audience of a, of a specific journal, but they, they just think, okay, this is related to behavior and this is why I submitted to, let's say, ethology or one of the other behavioral journals. But if it is framed in a too narrow sense, so, I mean, just, I mean, I, I, I likely reject papers that start with Drosophila and end with Drosophila. So if, if the frame, if the frame of your work is just Drosophila and has no, no general behavioral meaning, then it's likely to be rejected, not because it's a bad paper. It might be, it might be really exciting findings regarding Drosophila, but it might not be relevant for a general behavioral audience. So it, it might be more appropriate in a, in a special journal that focuses on Drosophila behavior or something like that. So I think this is something that people and uh, should should take into account. I mean, use 
use the sand hour structure of a paper. I mean, start with the broad idea and, and explain why your specific uh, organism or why your specific question is relevant for that broad idea. Then come up with your results and and end broad again. But if you if you start with your organism and if you end with your organism, most likely in a behavioral journal, you, that's the wrong the wrong audience. But you could easily change that often. So if we are talking about switching between journals, and uh, a mistake that often is is made by people is that they do not take the reviewers of the previous submission serious. So, and submitted to another journal without, without uh, uh, revising the manuscript in the sense of the previous reviewers. That's a big mistake, but often, because often the same reviewers will get it from another journal and then you are in trouble. So I always advise to take every review serious that you get from journal, even if it is rejected. Uh, uh, there's a question from Zuleima, and I apologize, I missed it before. Thanks, David, for reminding me. So we're going on to Zuleima. If you're still there, I apologize. Zuleima is here. Yeah, she's always I'm joining still us. Here. There, there it's you are. okay. My I, apologies. I just, I just put it in. I just put it in a few minutes ago, so um, it's fine. Um, Suleyma Tang Martinez from the University of Missouri in St. Louis. And I want to, it's really not a question, it's more a comment about the question having to do with diversity and with papers that come in that are not in uh, proper or understandable English and the way that journals deal with that. And I'm uh, speaking about animal behavior. I wish Nancy Solomon were here, but I, it looks like she left because she would be the one that would be most appropriate to speak to this. I, I think I've been sort of gone from the higher ranks of AVS for about a year now, so I'm not sure what has happened, but I know that at one point we were trying to get like um, volunteers who would be willing to look at papers that come in that seem to be okay um, in terms of the, the actual research, but have problems with um, English and have people who would volunteer. And in fact, we were suggesting that even before the paper was sent in, if the authors felt that there could be an issue with the language that they could submit the paper, not for publication, but for English review, and then we would use one of these, you know, volunteers to go through the paper. Um, I know that Oh gosh, about over a year ago now, um, I got a paper to review um, from South America. It was a, I thought it was a very well done paper and the data looked really interesting. The question was really interesting, but the English was a mess. And so um, because I'm Latin American and my first language is Spanish, I decided that I would try to get this paper uh, sufficiently corrected that it could be published. And it went through three rounds of revisions. Um, and I really worked hard on this paper. At one point I did sort of the equivalent of a um, track changes on it with explanations for why the changes were being made. And this is largely, I mean, a few things were like, you know, this really doesn't fit here, or this is sort of, extraneous to the rest of the discussion, but much of it was simply correcting the English and correcting the terminology that was being used. And it was very funny because I could look at what they wrote in English and translate it literally uh, back to Spanish. It made sense, but for an English reader, it would not make sense. But after three rounds of, um, of revisions, they finally got the paper published and I was I mean, I felt almost like, you know, this was a, a huge victory for me and it was really for them. So, um, so I think that, you know, things can be done by journals. And I really like this idea of having people who are there just like you have statistical reviewers when you need 
to call on them, we could also have people who would be um, like language reviewers, if you want, for people who come from non-English speaking countries. So I'll just stop at that. Thanks. Uh, Eduardo, you are can't hear, you can't hear you, Eduardo. We are almost at 2 p.m. I have a question from Alba without an S or a P. Is it your question or comes from YouTube or, or, or is it your question, Alba? Okay. It is mine, we'll but take, it's not that important we'll take, either. So. We'll take Alba and Facundo and then we'll stop there. We Our okay. panelists deserve a, deserve a rest of, after this. Alba, you go, then Facundo, and we'll wrap okay. it up there. Talking about not a uh, native English speaker, here I go. Uh, so I may be cheating because I have Dr. Gadakar's uh, responses and I found one of them really, really interested and I would like him to comment a little bit more um, about that and also hear like other panelists uh, thoughts about it. Uh, it is the question about how do you balance the importance of data ac accessibility and code availability and authors intellectual rights uh, in data production? So if you want to comment about that, Dr. Gadakar. This is about data accessibility, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking now like an editor, I'm thinking now as an author, and I'm very uncomfortable if somebody says that, see, sometimes you do a long study and you want to publish four or five papers and you want to begin, but you don't want to wait till all the five are written. And it would, I would be very uncomfortable if I have to surrender my data for others to start squeezing it before I have a chance. And so I'm very uncomfortable. I can see the importance of making it publicly available, but we must find the right balance. But for me, there's another angle. This problem becomes very serious for people who do very expensive research, where you spend a lot of public money. Most of my research doesn't cost any money and I feel I'm entitled to keep to my data for some time and then make it available to a, general, uh, to a general public. So we have to find the golden balance depending how expensive it is, how much public money has been used, how many more things can come out of it. We need, uh, we need some balance and also it has to be a case by case thing. I don't like a rule saying that you cannot publish your first paper until you make all the data available publicly. I would be very uncomfortable. I would leave science. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll take now Facundo's question, our last question of the panel. Yeah, unfortunately, as the last one, it strays a little bit from the stats side of things, but hopefully it'll be helpful to, to some of the younger researchers like myself. Um, some of you were discussing the right fit for your journals, um, and that's completely understandable and valid for younger students that are starting out short of just reading a ton of papers from a ton of different journals in the field. Are there any recommendations to check for, for the fit of the journal? I mean, a lot of the scopes and aims you have on the website are seem to fit but then maybe there are underlying things that we don't know about um is there anything you recommend doing or checking or seeing how to fit those um i would i would say don't be frightened to write to editors and ask do, do you know what i mean it's i think people sort of feel like you just can't somehow you can't do that but but i if you're unsure you can send the abstract you can send the uh, draft I'll, you know, I will happily, and if I'm not sure, I'll ask a handling editor and an associate editor to have a look. I mean, so I think it goes back to the comment someone made about being an editor and not a postman. It was again wrong. Um, that that is our job. It's not just to sort of judge you and find you wanting. It's to help you produce the best paper that you can. Because you know, we off we want we do want people to succeed. I know it can seem like you're just there to sort of you know, reject people and judge them. and uh, But in fact, I spend a lot of time helping people, you know, get their paper into shape so that it, I mean, like Zulane was saying, so that it will have the best chance of being picked up. And, you know, so so if you have any doubt, I just I just think, remember that everyone sits who sits behind these, um, you know, 
website things is a human being and then and they're all they've all been in your position and they're mostly very willing to you know time permitting willing to help you especially when you're getting going we've all been in that that position it's a way of paying it forward so um I think that's that's the thing to do is like if you're unsure just ask and people will help you and also point you in a in the direction of, of a more suitable journal if they think that I mean that's what I try to do you know when I after just je- reject, I always try to make a good suggestion of where they will, ta- you know, reach their target audience more effectively. Because often it's nothing to do with the paper as quality of it. It's just we have a limited number of pages, we have a limited number of issues. We can't publish everything. It's just put, it's just getting people in the right in the right place um, for the for their particular topic area and particular paper. I fully agree. We have, we have, I fully agree have, with that. Yeah. I fully agree with that, and uh, we are there to help uh, people to publish uh, the papers. Nothing else. We have gone. We have gone yeah, longer, really... longer than the two hours. Give me. I just want to let our YouTube community. We're gonna stop the live streaming now. It doesn't mean we were gonna kick you out of the Zoom meeting. I'm just gonna finish the live streaming. Thank you to those of you who are watching us via YouTube. Remember that the meeting is recorded. You 